We have seen in the previous segment that the protection of reputation constitutes a valid ground for restricting freedom of expression. We have also seen how a balance between free speech and reputation may be reached and the abuses that constitute criminal defamation. In this segment, I will explore some of the ways the internet and information technology have impacted on defamation and the emerging challenges and preliminary responses that have been developed. As a primary space for information and expression, the digital space has not escaped from claims based on reputation or honor, both civil and criminal. Indeed, there are a vast and increasing number of cases related to online expression, including expression published through Facebook, Twitter, or WhatsApp. One of the saddest cases I came across recently uh, regarding defamation concerned a Saudi Arabian woman who put up a WhatsApp status that said, and I quote, I pray to be patient enough to put up with you, followed by her husband's initials. The husband sued his wife, alleging that the status damaged his reputation. The suit was brought on the basis of the Saudi anti-cybercrime law, prohibiting defamation and inflicting of damage onto others. In 2015, a court agreed that there was the status on WhatsApp harmed the husband's reputation, and it imposed 70 lashes on the woman as well as a fine. This is an extreme case of um, defamation online. Um, but on the other hand, there are quite a few of those cases of people found guilty of defamation for very short statement, sometimes 140 characters, for a post on Facebook, which they may have thought was uh, private, um, for photos used um, and circulated through uh, various uh, platforms. Defamation online raises a number of difficult issues for the court and uh, for the practitioners and for users. As with all other issues related to online expression, these are still in a state of flux and rulings or policy decisions may contradict each other, particularly if you're looking at them from a global standpoint, but even um, at a national level, there are many uh, decisions by court that don't necessarily uh, fit with each other. So let me highlight some of the main challenges and responses. The first challenge is related to uh, the place of jurisdictions. And with that comes a number of other issues that have been characterized as libel tourism and multiple publication rule. As I have presented last week in, in week five, the online revolution poses a problem of jurisdiction. Where is the place of jurisdiction for online content? Is it where the content is first uh, produced? Is it where a server is located? Is it where the platform headquarters are located? Is it where the content is read? Is it where the content is downloaded? There are many different options. This problem had already a version in the offline world as far as defamation is concerned. It's a so-called problem of libel tourism. That um, basically means that defamation plaintiffs seek specific jurisdictions in which they believe the courts are more likely to be friendly to their cause, even if the case has very little connection with the country whose laws they want to invoke. So for instance, before the reform of the United Kingdom defamation law, a number of oligarchs from Russia or Ukraine, for instance, sued publication under the UK libel law, even though the publication itself may have been uh, produced elsewhere, and even though the oligarch were not resident of the United Kingdom. Luckily, this form 
of foreign shopping has been largely counted, not completely, but largely counted over recent years, including through legal reform of the defamation laws, such as the United Kingdom or the US, which used to be a major place uh, for uh, this kind of libel tourism. The UK reform for the defamation law provides that where the defendant is outside the European Union, the court will not have jurisdictions to hear and determine an action unless the jurisdiction of England and Wales is clearly the most appropriate place. So in the past, the presumption was in favor of accepting jurisdictions. Under the new law, the position is just the opposite. The jurisdiction requirement will be fulfilled only in exceptional cases. That's for, of course, the offline world and the online world. But online publication does raise related problems as far as the jurisdiction is concerned regarding the place of publications which um, are currently being addressed. Should defamation occur in the jurisdictions where the material is downloaded, where it is first published? We need to stay tuned on that one, although it will be logical to limit the claims to one jurisdiction only. But as I have mentioned, um, the courts around the world are delivering very different ruling at, at this stage. So there is no real sense of a global norms emerging, even though um, people like me, uh, press freedom activists, uh, lawyers that are defending a uh, claimant um, against defamation, all of those are arguing that there should be one jurisdiction only and that it will be logical for that jurisdiction to be the place of uh, where the product has been downloaded, the place where the content has been downloaded. Another related issue also uh, within that uh, framework of jurisdictions inherited from the offline world is that of the single or multiple publication rule. The multiple publication rule allows someone to complain about a defamatory comment every time that statement has been republished. You can well imagine what this rule means in the digital world where people emails, retweet, tweet, repost statements published by others and across borders. In contrast, under the single publication rule, any form of mass communication is considered as a single communication and can give rise to only one action for libel. Around the world, courts have increasingly adopted a single publication rule when confronted with libel online, considering in particular that the World Wide Web constitutes one single mass media. If it's being published several times through uh, the World Wide Web, only one defamation claim can be made. For instance, the rule was adopted by the US for defamation and traditional media and extended to the cyberspace for the first time in, in a case called First versus State in uh, 2002. The UK Defamation Act of 2013 entered into force at the beginning of 2014 has also done away with the multi-publication uh, rule and adopted a single publication rule. In India, uh, fairly recently, in um, the case of uh, Kawar uh, versus Azif Nazir Mir, the, um, the court rejected the, the multiple publication rule and adopted the single publication rule for libel on the internet. These are just three of the examples, but uh, globally, the, the trend is towards uh, a single publication rule and the norm, um, meaning the norm that uh, international expert bodies have put forward is indeed that of the single publication rule. A second challenge related to the online world and to defamation is that of the liability of intermediaries. And we have already dealt with that uh, a lot last, last week. Uh, I've um, discussed the liability of social media in particular for 
uh, third party content, content, content uh, produced by others. I have explained already that there are three liability regimes. The most frequent one is that intermediaries should not be held liable provided they act quickly to remove the content which they have been informed of was defamatory. And I have also highlighted already the risk this regime poses and the possible response. One issue which um, I have not discussed so far concerns um, the autocomplete um, function of search engine. These two have been the object of a civil defamation lawsuit. Indeed, the judicial trends indicate that these functions and related ones are uh, increasingly the object of successful defamation claims, although the legal tools, the legal argument used to achieve this objective may vary a great deal. For instance, in 2013, a German federal court ordered Google to remove offensive or defamatory search suggestions when it was notified of an unlawful violation of a person's right. It rejected Google's argument that its automated process merely reflected the search words used by other people and could not be modified. In 2014, in Hong Kong, uh, one of the main entertainment tycoon in, in Hong Kong has brought a lawsuit against Google because the autocomplete function of the search, search engine linked him to triad gangs. Every time somebody enter or began writing the name of that entertainment tycoon, the autocomplete will automatically add the name of gangs, uh, criminal gangs. And that um, was found to be uh, an insult, a defamation, uh, by, by this uh, gentleman who then sued Google in a Hong Kong court. So the case is ongoing and it will probably go through many different stages because it is a very important case. But I, I want to uh, quote here uh, the court of first instance, which um, argued that the evidence demonstrated that Google was capable of censoring material generated through its search. Accordingly, and I quote uh, here from the, the court, it was questionable whether Google is a neutral tool and therefore there was a good arguable case that Google Incorporated is more than a passive facilitator vis-à-vis -vis their autocomplete and related search features. As with other forms of intermediary liability, this kind of decision from the uh, Hong Kong court is being challenged. Uh, indeed, it's absolutely not yet the norm around the world, uh, and it is a far, it's an issue that is far from being settled. But if you uh, remember, uh, last week, the, 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 the segment on intermediary liability did highlight a progressive trend towards finding intermediaries increasingly liable. And I think that trend also apply to uh, the auto search um, uh, function of um, the autocomplete function of, of search uh, engine. So um, to sum up, the digital revolution has had two interrelated impact on reputation claims. First, it has resulted in a vast increase of the number of cases filed for defamation, often in the most problematic fashion, such as defamation claims based on 140 characters of Twitter. Second, it has forced the legal and judicial world to rethink some of its legal categories and the responsibilities of those involved in providing internet services. As highlighted last week, there is yet no settled global norms over these questions which remain in a state of judicial and legal flux and will probably do so in many years to come, that is as long as the technology keeps evolving. Thank you very much.